Hi everybody, my name is Will Gorham and I own a small hobby nursery here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And today we're going to be talking about carnivorous plants. The nursery that I own specializes in growing carnivorous plants and we're one of the only places in the state that really does that. A lot of people think carnivorous plants are these exotic tropical plants that come from the jungles in Asia. And that's true for some plants. But the vast majority of carnivorous plants are native to here in the United States, which a lot of people really don't know. For example, the classic carnivorous plant that people think about is the Venus flytrap. And instead of coming from some far off exotic steamy jungle, Venus flytraps only grow naturally in a 50 mile radius around Wilmington, North Carolina. And a lot of people are really surprised when they hear that. Um, I started growing carnivorous plants when I was about eight years old. I grew up in Louisiana, not far from where carnivorous plants grew naturally, and I would see them often in the wild, so which kind of sparked my interest. And my grandmother gave me my first Venus flytrap, which started this whole process of growing carnivorous plants and led me to where I am today. Um, one of the things about carnivorous plants is there's lots of different kinds of them. People think that it's just the Venus flytrap or what this or that. And there's actually about 375 species of carnivorous plants that are found all over the world. Um, there are uh, different types. So like we have, you know, the classic, as I said, Venus flytrap that's native here in North America. We also have North American pitcher plants, which are, again, native to North America, and they grow along the Gulf Coast, so Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, across into Georgia, Florida, up the East Coast, and even as far north as Canada. We have sundews that are native to North America. We have butterworts that are native to North America. We have bladderworts that are native to North America. And there's different species, several different species of all of those. There's South American pitcher plants. There's Australian pitcher plants. Asian pitcher plants. And, um, and there are a few other little kind of weird little one-off carnivorous plants that there aren't very many of. Uh, there may be something like a Portuguese pine um, but you really don't see those, especially in cultivation very often, but the ones that we're going to talk about today are the ones that are commonly grown in cultivation, you know, for here, especially here in the United States. There's several different trapping mechanisms that the plants use. So you have, first off, we have snap traps. So like, for example, a Venus flytrap has a hinged leaf. So when something gets caught in the trap, the trap snaps closed. Another type of trap would be a pitfall trap. And that's gonna be predominantly any of your pitcher plants. So the North American, South American, Australian, Asian, all of those pitcher plants are gonna use a pitfall trap. So they have a pitcher, like what you would pour water out of, um, something similar to the shape of it, and the bug, will, the insect will actually crawl down inside of it, get stuck, and can't get out. Um, some of the pitcher plants, they vary in size. Some of them are very small, and the entire plant itself is three or four inches across, which could be like, for example, an American pitcher plant, where the Asian pitcher plants might be 50 feet long in a vine, and their pitchers will be larger than a two-gallon bottle, and they're big enough to trap rats. Um... The like the Australian pitcher plants, they're they're like American pitcher plants. They're kind of small as well. They don't get very big. And the South American pitcher plants are really small. Um, the next type of trap is going to be a, a what we call a flypaper trap. So it means the trap is sticky. So for example, sundews or butterworts, their leaves are going to be covered in tentacles, and at the end of each tentacle is going to have a drop of glue and the insect will land on the leaf, they get stuck to the, glue, the, the glue, and they can't leave. They can't get away because they're stuck, actually glued to the leaf, like a piece of flypaper. And the leaf will actually fold up around that, and then it'll start to, um, 
it will start to release digestive enzymes and to break down the insect. And once it breaks down the insect with the digestive enzymes, it absorbs all of the nutrients and then it will, you know, open, uncurl, and you can still see the, the exoskeleton for the insect there. Um, bladder warts are really interesting. They are tiny little plants. They don't get very big, but they're mainly aquatic. Some grow on the land. Typically, they're an aquatic floating plant, and they're covered in little bladders, They just little bags that are smashed shut, and they have a trigger hair, and when something touches that hair, it triggers the trap to activate, and the trap pops open and sucks in the water, and whatever triggered the hair gets sucked in with it. So like a mosquito larva or some type of small aquatic insect would be trapped. Um, growing them, in, especially here in Arkansas, is really, really easy to do. They're not very high maintenance, which people are really surprised to hear about. At my nursery, we grow our carnivorous plants our North American plants outside year-round. For our tropical plants, like the Asian pitcher plants, we grow them outside during the spring, summer, and fall, and at the sign of frost, we'll bring them inside and put them in a greenhouse. Um, for example, if you would like to grow a Venus flytrap, they need to be planted in 50% peat moss and 50% sand. Mix that very well put them in a little, like a four inch flower pot. You would plant the, the, the Venus flytrap in it and you would set that into a pot of water. And it needs to stay wet uh, and to keep the pot sitting in about an inch of water at all times. The reason that they need to be kept wet is because they are naturally bog plants. And a bog is defined as a wet area that really doesn't have a lot of nutrition in the soil that also doesn't have very many trees. So there's not a lot of shade, and that means the plants are gonna need a lot of sun. Even though they're carnivorous, they're still plants, and all plants need sun to grow for photosynthesis. And carnivorous plants are no different. The, the reason that they're carnivorous is because since they grow in such poor nutrient soils, they need the extra nitrogen and the phosphorus that they get from the insects to allow them to grow and bloom. So you've got your Venus flytrap potted in your 50-50 mix of perlite and sand, and you've got it sitting in about an inch of water, and you want to sit it outside where it's going to get full sun, or close to full sun. Minimum would be five to six hours of sun a day, um, anything less than that, and the plant's really not going to do very well. It's going to grow outside year-round, um, and during the winter people are worried that if it gets cold, if, if it freezes, the plant's going to freeze, it's going to die. Actually, the plant needs that cold period. They go through a period of dormancy from October till about May. And um, during that time, they're resting. And then starting in April to May, they're going to start blooming and they're going to send up their flower stalks. Carnivorous plants, like any other plant, are going to depend on other insects for pollination. So a carnivorous plant is going to bloom first be pollinated so it can set seed and reproduce, then it's going to start producing its traps. Because if you're eating your pollinators, you're not going to be able to perpetuate the species. Uh, and so it's really critical that they bloom before, before they start producing their traps. So at this time of year, our, you know, the Venus fly traps at our nursery are just starting to produce their first blooms. We have flower stalks that are a couple of inches tall right now. So it'll be late May by the time they're done blooming and really growing their full traps. Um, pitcher plants really grow, the American pitcher plants really grow the exact same way. They need bigger pots because they're going to get a lot bigger. So I grow my pitcher plants in about a six inch pot and some of my pitcher plants are four inches around for the entire plant. Some of them stand about three feet tall when they're full grown. I grow them exactly like I do my Venus fly traps, a 50-50 mix of peat and sand. Uh, pots, a, a nice well-sized pot. I keep them standing in about an inch of water for the year round and I let them die down during the winter so they can go dormant and rest. If the Venus fly trap, the American pitcher plants, the sundews, which you grow exactly the same way, if they're not allowed to have that rest period, they will just continually grow and they'll end up dying from exhaustion after a couple of years. 
So that's really, really critical. And, and understanding that when they're going dormant during the winter, they look like they're dying, but they're not. They're going to sleep, just like any other tree in Arkansas that's not an evergreen is going to lose its leaves. Carnivorous plants are really no different. Um, one of the next most common plants that you're going to see are the Asian pitcher plants. Asian pitcher plants are often called Nepenthes, and they range, there, there are probably 75 species of Nepenthes, and they're all found Southeast Asia, so India, there are a couple of species in Madagascar, just off the coast of Africa, and the majority of them are going to be in the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Thailand, that area. Nepenthes grow from a vine. They're what we call a liana, L-I-A-N-A. -A, and basically any type of tropical jungle plant that creates a vine as it grows is called a liana. So with Nepenthes, you have a, the central vine that grows and there are leaves that come off of that central vine. From the end of each leaf, a tendril comes down and the tendril expands into the actual pitcher. And the pitchers look very different depending on the species of plant. They're usually really easy to tell apart. This species doesn't look like this species, for example. Then it's really obvious. Um, they do not tolerate the cold weather and they don't need a dormancy period like the North American plants do. They are tropical plants. So any, if it gets below about 45, you're really gonna start having a lot of problems with them growing temperature-wise. They don't need as much sun as the North American plants do because they are a tropical plant and they do grow in the jungle. So the trees in the jungle obviously are huge and they create a lot of shade. So Nepenthes have evolved to not need as much light as some of the other carnivorous plants do. Um, Nepenthes are very different from other plant, or other carnivorous plants rather, because they actually have male or female plants. So you have to have a male Nepenthes and a female Nepenthes for the plants to actually set seed. And they're one of the only carnivorous plants that have genders, male or female. The Nepenthes that we grow here are relatively easy to grow as well. We grow them in a little, they're a little more difficult to grow, not quite a beginner plant like the North American plants are. We grow them in a mixture of orchid bark, long fibered moss, and perlite. And as we grow them together, we, we mix the perlite in, we keep them wet. They're again, they're a bog plant, but they don't like to be as wet as the North American plants do. So we keep them a little drier. Um, as the Nepenthes grow, they start creating vines. And with ours, some of ours, we have vines that are six or eight feet long that are hanging over the edge of the pots. And the pitchers are probably maybe a foot tall on some of our plants. Um, we grow Nepenthes from seed. Like I said, they, need, they have a male and a female plant. Growing them from seed takes a really long time to do that. We propagate most of our Nepenthes by taking cuttings. We cut the vine in pieces. We'll put it in a terrarium with high humidity. And so each, little, each part where we cut the vine will root into a new plant. And that's how we propagate our Nepenthes. And they, it's been very, very successful for us. Um, we also have butterworts, which are small plants. Uh, they're usually a couple of inches across at the most. They're a real light green color, and they're a flypaper they're a fly paper trap. They're a little bit harder to grow than some of the other plants are. They're a little bit less tolerant of sun. They're a little bit less tolerant of drying out. Um, we don't grow very many species of butterworts. They're a little more high maintenance than some of the other plants, so they're not quite as popular with customers at the nursery. The other type of plant that we grow are sundews. Sundews are also a flypaper trap. They come in a variety of species. Some are long and really tall, thin, they look kind of like blades of grass. Others are short and grow in a rosette, in like in a circle. And they will also, they're also a flypaper trap and they're very easy to reproduce from seed as well. We can also grow the butterworts and the um, sundews from cuttings as well. And that seems to be a really good way for us to propagate those plants.
Some of the plants that don't really grow well in Arkansas would be the South American pitcher plants. It gets far too hot here for them. South American pitcher plants tend to grow in the mountains of uh, South America. And because they're from such high altitudes, the air there is really cool. You know, between, let's say, it gets to the 40s at night. And because during the summers here it doesn't get that cold, they're very, very difficult to grow. Cobra lilies are a North American pitcher plant that's native to California. They're not native to the Gulf Coast. They're one of the only species of North American pitcher plants that are not native to the Gulf Coast. We grow them just like we grow our other pitcher plants, but they're difficult to grow here as well for the same reason. They're from high altitude locations and because of the cooler temperatures that they have at night, we are not able to really replicate that well here in Arkansas and so they're a ch quite a challenge to grow for people here. So we really don't recommend those for beginners as well. Um, that really sums up everything that we have to talk about carnivorous plants. I think that a lot of people are really surprised at how many varieties and how many species of carnivorous plants they are. And when people start growing them they, and realize how easy they are to grow, they're really amazed thinking that they're some really kind of complicated plant and they're really not. They don't take a lot of baby, they don't need a lot of babying. They can really handle a lot of abuse. So if you're ever in the market for a carnivorous plant, I would recommend that you look, do some research on the internet, find a nursery that might suit your needs and go ahead and pick up one and give it a try. I think you'll really enjoy it.